Hi there. My name is Sinead Fitzgerald, and I'm honoured to co-lead Code Without Barriers in Australia and New Zealand. I'm working alongside the amazing Michelle Sanford. I also head up healthcare SaaS partnerships for ANZ at Microsoft, and I've been doing that for about two years. Prior to that, I spent a decade at Apple. Now, what excites me about Code Without Barriers is our mission to promote diversity and inclusion in the tech industry. We are not only eliminating obstacles, but constructing bridges, bridges that link talented women with opportunities, enable them to flourish and amplify their voices in the tech industry and beyond. Because when women succeed, we all succeed. I truly believe that innovation, entrepreneurs, creators and developers must reflect society. Our goal is to help close the gender gap in the region's rapidly expanding cloud, AI and digital technology sectors. We provide a platform for women and gender diverse developers, founders, communities and organizations to contribute to inclusive economic growth. I'm delighted to welcome you to our International Women's Day stream, where we have a marvelous panel comprising motivational role models from the community. WA Young Australian of the Year and She Codes founder, Kate Kerwin. Renee Noble, who is a Microsoft Cloud Advocate and CEO of Girls Programming Network, CEO and founder of Connected Code, and Chief Executive Director of Tech Inclusion. As well as the fabulous Sarah Moran, who is the co-founder of Girl Geek Academy and co-founder of an AI startup called Patient Notes. They're gonna tell us about the communities of women they support. They're gonna give us a glimpse into their own career journeys and they'll provide valuable advice for women who are either working in or aspiring to join the tech industry. But first, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker, Vanessa Sorensen, Microsoft Code Without Barriers executive sponsor for Australia and New Zealand. She is the Microsoft Chief Partner Officer for ANZ, as well as the Managing Director for Microsoft New Zealand. And Vanessa is also the chief executive sponsor for the 10K Wahini program that we launched in New Zealand to bring 10,000 women into tech careers. Vanessa will open our session today by sharing some of her personal story. Thank you, Vanessa. Hello, and welcome to Code Without Barriers. Welcome to you all, and thank you for investing your time in this amazing session. I'm Vanessa Sorensen and I'm beaming in from my hometown of Auckland, New Zealand. I have blonde hair and blue eyes and I'm wearing a black flowery dress. And my pronouns are she and her. So, Code Without Barriers. We are launching across Australia and New Zealand, all during April. This could not be without the incredible support of many, including our wonderful Microsoft team. And again, thank you for all of you who have committed to doing this. So I'm Vanessa, someone who fell into tech around 35 odd years ago. Yep, I'm showing my age. You see, I'm a high school dropout. I was 16 when I left school. No formal education, and at many times feeling like I simply did not fit. But I now want to be a champion for all. In fact, we need more diverse talent in tech. And sharing my story is key, because when I grew up, I always thought, do I belong here? What this career has taught me and provided me is simply incredible. I never thought that one day I'd be in a major leadership role. However, I got myself mentors, I went on a massive learning journey, and I took risks. I really became a learn it all. In fact, learning never stops. And I also went for the really hard roles. Why? Because you can and you should. I personally want to be a leader who holds a hand up, not just a handout. Most women, including myself at times, simply don't feel good enough or supported 
when they see key tech roles coming up. So I want you all to leave this course knowing that that is simply not the case. In New Zealand, we launched an incredible platform called 10K Women. And this came about of us needing more incredible women diverse talent into tech. Our local team came up with this amazing offer to certify and skill and mentor all these women. Because I get it. Without a certificate, how do you go for a role in tech? How do you feel confident enough? And that's what this course did. And we are now tracking those ladies to make sure that they're landing in roles in tech. And they are earning more, they're feeling empowered, and we are creating powerful change. So let's unlock the incredible potential of women in the field of technology, particularly in the realm of coding. We live in an age where technology permeates into every aspect of our life, from the way we communicate, to the way we work, and the way we play. Yet, despite the advances that we've witnessed, there remains a glaring gender disparity within the tech industry. It's time to change that narrative. Coding isn't just about creating lines of code, it's about crafting solutions, shaping the future, and leaving an indefinable mark on the world. Women bring unique perspectives, creativity, and problem solving. And by harnessing their talents, we can revolutionize the tech landscape and propel society forward. Imagine in a world where apps we use, the software we rely on, and the algorithms we trust are developed with diversity in mind. This isn't just wishful thinking, it's a tangible reality that we can create together. When women are empowered to pursue careers in tech, we unlock a wealth of innovation and it benefits all. There's some incredible examples globally on how diversity in tech has already brought goodness to the world. If I think of healthcare advancements, personalized medicine to remote patient monitoring, women in tech are driving groundbreaking innovation that is revolutionizing healthcare. Their unique perspectives had led to more inclusive and effective solutions, ultimately saving lives and improving quality of care. Environment sustainability, women-led initiatives are developing innovative software and hardware solutions to monitor environment data. And they're bringing a more sustainable planet for future generations. Accessibility. Women in tech are championing accessibility and inclusivity by designing software and devices that empower individuals of disabilities. I see this every day in Microsoft by the most incredible leader, Jenny, who leads this. The gaming consoles, everything in tech is all from an innovative perspective of breaking down those barriers, creating a more inclusive digital world for all. And our work is far from done. We must continue to champion diversity and inclusion in the tech industry, creating pathways for women to enter, thrive and lead. We need to dismantle the barriers that we have historically held women back and create a culture of support, mentorship and empowerment. So I urge you, let's not just talk about change, let's be the change. Let's inspire the next generation of women coders, engineers, and tech leaders. Together, we can harness the power of diversity to create a brighter, more inclusive future for all. Remember, ladies, you are 80% better than you think you are. Go forward, learn, grow, and be the change that we need. And good luck. I hope that our paths cross one day, and you can let me know of your incredible journey into an amazing career in tech. Thank you. Wow, wasn't that a powerful story? Now I'm gonna pass straight into our panel of inspirational role models. We have Kate Kerwin from She Codes, Renee Noble, who is the CEO of Girls Programming Network, and Sarah Moran, co-founder of Girl Geek Academy. Each of them, will share their experiences in building and supporting communities, their career paths, 
and offer valuable guidance for women and non-binary individuals who are either already in the tech industry or aspiring to join it. Hi everyone, welcome to the Code Without Barriers live stream day coming to you from Australia and New Zealand. We are super excited to be with you today. I have a panel of amazing women who are going to share some tips and tricks, some advice, tell you their life stories. It is going to be wonderful. Um, why don't we kick off by introducing ourselves. I should probably go first because I always forget to do that. I am Michelle Sanford. I am the developer engagement lead for Microsoft in Asia right now and I am super excited to uh, be with you all on this wonderful day. Uh, Renee, do you want to go next? I certainly do. Um, I'm Renee Noble. I am any MC's worst nightmare to introduce um, I have, because I have too many roles. I work for Microsoft as a cloud advocate for my day job, as we'll say. Um, helping people up to, helping out people upskill on cloud technologies and learn how to do cool stuff and make a difference in the world um that perpetuates throughout my other two jobs i'm going to tell you about i am also the uh ceo of the girls programming network and the charity that encompasses it tech inclusion uh and we are women and gender diverse people teaching girls and gender diverse kids to code for free around australia and I also run my own business on the side, Connected Code, that's this one, uh, going into schools to help teachers teach the digital technologies curriculum or going in there, upskilling teachers or doing community groups and cool stuff like that. So I do anything that is tech, community and education rolled into one. And yeah, so I love doing that. And for doing that last year, I was awarded the Champion of Change by Women in Digital at the Women Digital Awards last at the end of last year. So I've done cool, fun stuff um, to help people learn to code. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, Kate, do you want to go next? Um, new headphones, so I'm just trying to get used to. <clears throat> uh, I'm Kate. I'm the founder and CEO of She Codes Australia. We're a coding program for women trying to solve the gender gap in technology. You might see a little bit of a theme on this panel today. Um, I'm really passionate about that space. I'm uh, not from a technical background um, and was trying to teach myself how to code and then found this community um, of other women like me who wanted to learn as well. So been on that journey for about nine years. Um, I've also been awarded a few awards in the recent times. Um, so I was just named as the WA West Australian Young Australian of the Year um, for 2024, which is crazy. Um, so I had the opportunity to go to Canberra and meet the Prime Minister, um, the Governor General, um, and all of the other cool people doing cool things all across Australia, which is um, super exciting. That's what I love is meeting passionate people who love what they do and are trying to save the world. <laughs> Wonderful. You should have totally won the whole Australian thing. But, you know, they didn't let me vote. So <laughs> <laughs> fools. <laughs> uh, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Sarah Moran and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Girl Geek Academy and uh, we're celebrating our 10th birthday this year, this International Women's Day. Um, we started by running um, hackathons for women and we expanded into lots of other activities and now we focus on um, championing change in bigger systems like annoying the government and making sure their policies help create uh, systems of inclusion for women um, throughout industry and also, also throughout the education system. Um, I'm also, I have been bitten by the AI bug and I am a co-founder of Patient Notes which is a tool that helps health practitioners to generate their clinical notes faster. So admin is a big burden for a lot of people in the healthcare industry. And we're seeing a lot of, you know, really, really fascinating things that we can do with AI to help um, help healthcare practitioners really keep focused on their patients and reduce that admin burden. Oh, so cool. <laughs> yeah, so fun. I'm so glad <laughs> to be back on the tools, I tell you. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right then, well, let's dig a little bit deeper into those organisations, I guess. Um, uh, Kate, do you want to tell us the origin story for She Codes, the, the mission, the vision, the, how that came about? Yeah, so 
Um, like I mentioned, I didn't come from a technical background. My background is events. Um, and I started working for a co-working space in Perth um, and was just surrounded by people who were uh, business owners, app developers, people doing cool stuff. And I just got really curious. So that curiosity led me to trying to teach myself how to code. Um, and I got frustrated very quickly because I got to a point where I got stuck and I was trying to ask around for help from the community. And a lot of the communities that existed weren't very beginner friendly, weren't very female friendly. If you've ever been on notice board, they're full of like interesting people. Um, so got really frustrated that those communities didn't exist. So we set about running a one day workshop to try and solve that problem. And then um, that's kind of spiraled um, from then to where we are now of running workshops Australia wide. Um, and we also run a six month program that we've given out $2.5 million worth of scholarships over the last five years um, to get people from that beginner level through to job ready in tech um, and working with people in industry to be able to fund those places. They get a pipeline of talent too. Um, so that was kind of the, the origin and the big goal is our, our super audacious goal is to inspire 100,000 women across Australia by 2025, um, which scares me every time that I look at the date because that's next year. Um, <laughs> but we've supported, we've directly <laughs> taught 7,500 women and our broader impact um, is estimated at about 30,000. So we're getting a lot closer, we've got a long way to go. Uh, but I love sharing where that number came from because I think there's a lot of people that just pull a number from somewhere of like, oh, like 100,000, that sounds like a good number. Um, that 100,000 came from at the time when we were looking at the statistics just a couple of years ago, um, the stats were showing that we needed another 200,000 people in Australia um, to be in tech for Australia to stay globally competitive. So we looked at that and thought, if we can have half of the people coming into tech in the next five years be women, um, we still won't have complete 50-50 parity, but like we'll be a hell of a lot closer than we are right now. Um, so that also really like brings joy to me that we've got a really audacious target, but there's there's some thought behind why that number exists and, and how we want to reach it. And you, so like your biggest, your biggest cohort is in Perth, but you have cohorts in other parts of the country now. Where where are the other ones? Yeah, so we've been in Brisbane since 2020. Um, you can ask me now or some other time about what the experience of expanding interstate in the middle of a pandemic was, because <laughs> um, that was arguably the best and the worst time to uh, expand operations into Queensland. Um, so we've been running there for the last four years. Um, we've also run some programs in Sydney. I've done one one day workshop in Melbourne. Um, but what really like brings me a little bit of joy as well is the stuff that we've been able to do in the regional areas. So in Western Australia, we've done, um, and this may not mean anything to you if you're not from Western Australia, um, but we've been as far north as Port Hedland and Caratha. We've been out to Newman, which is literally like kind of the middle of nowhere in the middle of Australia. Um, we've been down to, uh, we've been to Geraldton, down to Bunbury, Albany, which is pretty much the most southern point of Western Australia. So that's about four and a half thousand kilometres span across all of the things that we've done, um, which is really, really, really cool. Um, and one of the girls who went through our longer program, she first experienced coding from one of those one day workshops in Karatha um, when she was there for work and has kind of seen that come full circle. So um, that's super cool seeing that flow of people and being able to support people um, in the regions as well as in the cities. Yeah, it's a, it's an amazing program. It's definitely one of my favourites. Although all of you are here, I guess, because you're you're my favourites. Um, but yeah, the, uh, what I find really impressive is that women are moving into real jobs in the tech industry. There's a a woman that came through your program who joined Microsoft without my assistance at all, which I still found outrageous because <laughs> obviously I want to be able to say that it was because of me that she came in. 
and it was nothing to do with me she it was because of she codes and she applied independently and she works as a software engineer uh, and developer for clipchamp which is one of our microsoft uh, child companies so yeah glorious but um yeah tragedy that it wasn't <laughs> no direct intervention on I'll, that part. I'll, uh, I'll bring it up with with her next time I see her but I'm sure <laughs> we've, I think you've told that story around me at least twice now so she's probably <laughs> I'm never it. getting over it it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> but I think that is one of the really cool things about um you know how we've been able what we've been able to do is seeing that transition into jobs, 86% of our alumni have ended up in technical roles. Um, and when I, like I was recently at a few tech conferences and looking at them now versus three or four years ago, like the makeup of the conference is so different because there are so many more women in technical roles. And like, I, I'm not personally responsible for all of that. I definitely don't have uh, any, you know, uh preconceived ideas that all of that was me but a bunch of them were my girl (laughs) so (laughs) that's really cool to see that we're starting to see that shift and and people ask me you know has the industry changed over the last nine years that you've been doing this and like it has so um that's very cool (laughs) cool uh Sarah do you want to go next yeah, so um, the origin story of Girl Geek Academy is, so t- 10 years ago, it was International Women's Day, we'd been attending um, hackathons, you know, uh, regular hackathons here and there as women in industry, and we would turn up and it would be in a dark, gloomy space, uh, you know, Friday night till Sunday, eating nothing but cheap pizza and energy drinks. Um, by the end, you know, it was... Uh, yeah, these overwhelmingly male spaces uh, started to smell a little, which was, you know, not very fun. Um, and then at the end, these people would say to us, oh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, why don't more women come? And we were like, why does anyone come? This is, uh, you know, not not the most uh, accessible or friendly environment. And so as a group of women in industry, we came together and said, well, what would it look like if we designed an event that we would want to go to? Like, what, how would that feel different? What you know, what would we actually want to see? Um, and for us, we created, we, in Richmond, in Melbourne, um, we went to a co-working space and we had picnics for lunch, uh, you know, in, in the co-working space. And we had yoga and we had cupcakes and we had um, mentoring as some of the prizes that you'd win at the hackathon. And we just had an amazing time. And then afterwards we said, okay, great. Well, we should become friends with all the other women running all women hackathons because there are people, let's go find them. And we looked and we looked and we looked and it was 2014 and no one had done it. Um, No one had run an all women hackathon before um, anywhere in the world that we could find. And we realized, well, that's the easy bit, right? Like putting women together to have a cup of tea is, you know, cup of tea and coding is the easy part. So who's actually chomping at the hard bits if no one's even doing that base level of support? So we, you know, felt a bit guilty and we're like, well, now that we've noticed the problem, we should start biting into it. Um, And that really led to us having conversations with industry, um, with women in our community, but then also with government. Because um, if you want that big piece of systems change, you need lots of moving parts that are coordinated well beyond what you know, a group of individual women can achieve. Um, And so that really kicked us off on a path of what are some of the things that we could do to to help change that narrative. And, you know, as you said, Kate, getting to that goal of of the technologists we just need in Australia, um, I'm a bit more ambitious than you. I'm like, well, I think that we should get to 50-50, but, you know, by by the time that, you know, by 2030. Um, And so I think that we really need to see some proactive programs coming through. So I I annoy politicians about that regularly. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But, you know, we've we've learned a lot along the way as well. So we started off by running programs for ourselves. And then after a while, we were like, oh, hang on. If we'd have been teaching young girls 10 years ago, we could be hiring them today. And that's what kicked us off uh, thinking about what does it teach, you know, what does it take to to teach young girls? I personally learned to code when I was five. Um, A government grant put computers in my classroom. And the teacher didn't really know what to do with them, neither did we, and we all just got in and play. So for me, it was a very social activity to learn coding with friends. Um, And that's the environment that we recreated um, originally as like a school holiday program. So you drop the kids off, see you later, we'll look after the kids. 
And we had a heap of women who would volunteer to supervise and they thought they would be helping the girls coding. But the girls were helping each other so much that these, you know, gun women in tech, these amazingly talented women, their main role was taking girls to the toilet because they were just, can I please go to the bathroom, miss, was the question that they got. And so we thought about the design of that program and how could we actually maximise that mentoring and all that sort of thing. When parents would come to pick up their, their daughters, they would say, what did you teach them? I, I never learnt that at school. Can you teach me? And so we redesigned our programs to say, um, could you teach mums and daughters coding together? And then you get that benefit of being able to bring in the mentors that they can talk to the mothers and the daughters together and you really start to unlock um, a bigger community of learning. So even the way that we think about how we teach girls and women and what those programs look like evolve over time with what we learn. You know, I'm sure you all on the call have learnt things along the way and went, oh, if I do it this way, I get this benefit. And what are some of the different things that, that you can achieve? So, um, yeah, and now we are focused primarily on advocacy. Um, in part because a lot of us, we're 10 years older and we're seniors in industry now. Like we're the, you know, we started off in our 30s and, you know, I guess uh, navigating our mid-career path, if you like. Now that we're senior leaders, we recognise the um, the respect that we have in industry and the power that has in the conversations we can have with with companies and also with government and in the media as well. So that's the the role that we like to take in the, in the ecosystem. Awesome. <laughs> And speaking of coding to girls, uh, Renee. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's in the name, Girls Programming <laughs> Network. So, but it's not actually all about the girls, which is it's a little bit deceptive uh, almost. Um, so, yeah, the origin story, we've been around for 16 years and that actually predates me getting involved with GPN. Uh, so, yeah, I, I didn't come along till maybe 20 or 2013 maybe when I got involved. But it was, yeah, it existed when I potentially could have experienced something like GPN myself as a 16 year old girl, which would have been great because I had never heard of coding until I got to university to study chemical engineering and chemistry when I accidentally learned to code because some people living in college thought it would be fun to teach Renee to code at 11 p.m. one night. And that's how I got my first taste of coding. And that's how I ended up being working at Microsoft and running an organization that teaches girls to code. But something that was important along the way was GPN. Um, and GPN started 16 years ago as a way to in get women to have more confidence in their own technical abilities by teaching girls. So it's always been a two-pronged approach. Like the women improve their confidence. They realize they're actually really great at things. They like bed down those skills. Meanwhile, we teach all these girls to code. Uh, so it's, yeah. And since then, like it's been in a lot of forms since its initial conception. It was like a school it was an after school program. It was every week. It was once a month, et cetera. None of those quite fit because coding wasn't like the cool things for girls to do at the time. So there weren't that many girls coming along uh, to every week or they'd come at the start of the term, but then they'd peter off. So eventually the one day weekend workshop was stumbled upon uh, where girls would come in for one day and they'd build some sort of project in the day. And about just a bit after that point, I came in. I accidentally inherited GPN um, and thinking I was just going to run it for one term. Um, but instead, I'm here nearly 10 years later. Now, it's not a little organization. We just were a little, maybe 30 girls coming along to learn to code with, let's say, six women or so, teaching them to code for the day. Um, now, we operate we have look at our Sydney workshops we have 150 plus girls you know it was much bigger before COVID we're getting back up there the problem all of our happened the problem that happened was all of our girls graduated during COVID and now they're just volunteers so we have dozens upon dozens of volunteers to teach however many girls we can get but we're not just doing it in Sydney we're doing it in Canberra Perth Melbourne we're even doing a little bit in uh Burnie in Tasmania we've got Adelaide up and coming so we've got it happening all over the place teaching high school girls to code but we also have just recently piloted our GPN junior program for primary school girls um, where we're not only having our women teach but also our high school girls coming along to teach our primary school girls really having that full pipeline solution that is basically the premise of all of this is it's from 
you know, the first day you start, you can always see someone ahead of you in the pipeline, like, oh, she's just two years older than me. And she's doing such cool projects. And then, oh, and that person, she's just started uni and that's a really cool degree that she's doing. And that person's doing their first internship or that person's working at this cool company and seeing someone at every step of the journey of like, I want to get to there and I know someone along the way at every step. So just, yeah, fleshing out the GPN program from we're making a project to we've got a really like, thoroughly thought out pedagogy. We've got unplugged activities that we do for the younger kids. We've got mentoring that we do for the older girls. We've got uh, opportunities for people, whether they're technical or not, to come in and learn what we're going to be teaching the girls so they can also be part of the change that they want to see in the community. Uh, so yeah, GPN is just yeah trying to connect all of the dots along the way and then connect people right up from cut primary school right into industry. And we just want to do it all around Australia and connect with it. every uni, every industry partner that we can to make that happen. So yeah, that's what GPN's kind of doing. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, so recently uh, GPN had a day in WA and on the same day, She Codes also had a one day workshop. And I thought this is going to impact those two things because the, the mentors for each of them can can be coming from the same crowd um but it wasn't it was a massive she codes day and it was a massive gpn day and there were enough mentors for both of them and there were loads of girls and women in both and i just thought this is really an encouraging sign for for the way things are turning around as a result of the work that you're all doing because a few years ago you know, we would have been, we would, we wouldn't have been able to do that. Whereas today, there's, there's, I guess the only limit is maybe like the locations. Can you find a location big enough to house all the people you want to teach? <laughs> that has been my um, limiting factor. It's like we've run out of computers. Too many girls want to learn to code. But yeah, for that that day, we had 112 girls learning to code, and we always have a ratio of three kids to one adult. So we probably had like 35 volunteers. Meanwhile, she codes is happening around the corner. <laughs> yeah. So both events sold out, I'm pretty sure, which is um, very cool. And we have coordinated the next one, so we don't overlap. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, it was really cool to see that it all just happened um, and we were able to cross-promote a little bit to, to our mentor community because um, we actually had a wait list, which is wild. We've always had a participant wait list. That's nothing surprising. But the last couple, we've had a mentor wait list as well, which is um, like, yeah, super trippy. <laughs> it is. It is crazy. Um, fortunately, um, I just walk in anyway, even if I don't go. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, a sign of how busy I've been. I didn't go to the last one and I feel like it's the first one I haven't been to in like years and years. And I did feel a little bit empty inside that I was missing it. But also I slept all day. I was so tired. <laughs> Look, you've got to take care of your health first. That's the most important thing. Everything yeah. else comes second. <laughs> For sure. OK, well, um, you have each of you mentioned it a little bit, but um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more um, of your individual career stories. Um, Sarah, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So um, for me, I, I mentioned earlier that I learned to code when I was five uh, and then I kept coding and I, I kept you know doing all the Internet things, but it wasn't necessarily what I was specifically interested in in doing uh, for a career. I um, wanted to do everything. Uh, I had a teacher pull me aside once and say, Sarah, most people, their career interests are shaped like a pyramid. You know, you start off with lots of things, and then you narrow it down. And then you get to the top and you have this career that you want at the end. He said, your pyramid seems to be inverted. And I was like, yes, the more that I learn about the world, the more things that I would like to be doing and the more interests that I have. Um, but I was very well supported, um, you know, with code as part of what I do until I got to year 10. So I was the first girl at my school to enter a computer programming competition. We had uh, competitions 
you know, you can have your English competition, your maths competition, and they were these national competitions and you get a little certificate at the end. And um, I just wanted to do the computer studies one because they went with all the rest in my collection. Um, and then it turns out no woman from my school had done that before. And I was like, oh, that's nice. And then I got to year 10 and I was the last woman standing. And um, I, yeah, I, I, I really felt like I was alone. And so I went on to do other things. And so I have a degree in journalism. I love communications. Um, I think that's what makes me a great coder is I, I love being able to, to talk to people um, about what I'm building. And so I started off in journalism the year that YouTube was invented. And so for me, that reignited my love of the internet and all things digital. Um, and so that allowed me to have a pathway to then re-exploring those tech things that I had sort of left on the shelf. And I think it's important to remember that um, technology is constantly evolving and we can always pick up the tools wherever, wherever we're at. And so um, I had a very fruitful career doing lots of things in social media. And then more recently, uh, Sam Altman uh, from the CEO of OpenAI uh, did a public talk in Melbourne and I jumped on a plane to Melbourne. I was like, I'm going to hear what this person has to say with all of this new AI tools and things to play with. And it was from there that I caught the bug again. And um, so have been very excited to be building with AI tools for the last you know, eight or nine months. Um, and yeah, just, just a shout out to anybody who's thinking about, well, where can I start? We've been using the Microsoft Founders Hub and have found it really, really amazing for all of the tools. Uh, as I mentioned before, it's easy to feel like you're being left behind, but the tools are literally there right now. Anyone can be a founder. If, you, if you're listening to this, you're a founder. Congratulations. You don't know what you've founded yet, but I'm sure you're about to discover it. Um, <laughs> I highly encourage people to jump in and have a play. And there's so many tutorials, like all of that stuff that um, you know, we, you used to have to go to face-to-face -face workshops to sort of find is all there and accessible to you online and in a really friendly manner. So, um, yes, I have been obviously enjoying that quite a lot. And that is where I've got to today is now working with my tech company and making the most of all of those tools. That's awesome. I love a um, non-technical degree to a technical career story. My yeah. my undergraduate degree was philosophy. So, you know, totally all about that generalist background really, really sets you up well for a career in tech. Absolutely. <laughs> Uh, Renee, do you want to go next? Yeah, I'd love to go next because, yeah, Sarah's really uh, lent into like some of the things that I'll talk about when I get to the Microsoft part of my career because like, you know, telling people about Founders Hub is like a whole part of my career and telling people about all the free resources. But how I came to be here is like a long winding journey of like, as I said, I accidentally learned to code basically. Um, and then uh, as you heard, I like to do a lot of things also by the long time it took me to introduce myself. So I was doing chemical engineering and a science degree with chemistry major. And then I just thought I'd just smoosh in a computer science major in there as well and do all three of those, which I did. And eventually, yeah, I graduated with that. But along the way to do your chemical engineering degree, you have to do an internship because it's engineering requires you to do that to be graduate and also to get your certifications etc so i was in uh, i was interning at a paper factory we baked brown paper for baking cardboard boxes it's more exciting than it sounds uh working in the dry lab where you test how good the paper is um and there's just so much data because they just bought this like billion dollar paper manufacturing machine. The lab itself just had a big million dollar robot on it that tested the paper and see how good it was. But there's all this data um, that people weren't really doing good stuff with. And I was like, oh, I've done a couple of computer science subjects at this point. Like I can do a little bit of stuff with data. Meanwhile, there's Excel spreadsheets being thrown around, data being copied and pasted and placed in different places. I'm like, this is very concerning. Uh, so I kind of got my first taste then of like seeing a problem and then being like, I can fix this with coding. Um, so I went to like the general manager and was like, hey, can I do some coding because I've done coding at uni to fix this thing? And they were like, no one knows any coding. Once you leave uni, no one uses coding. Like, don't, nah, we don't, we don't really do coding here. I was like, that's sad. So then I taught myself VBA, which is the programming language behind Excel, because they all use Excel. Um, they don't need to know there's any coding going on. So I made this whole thing. I coded all the stuff so they could stop 
every day they're making the same same graphs and it's taking them forever. What if we just use VBA to pull all the stuff, filter all the data, and everything's going to be hunky dory? It's going to be great. And then yeah, they were like obsessed with that solution from a 21 year old version of myself that I've just things I wasn't even doing it on in work time. I was just doing it on my bus ride to and from Botany Bay every day to make this technological solution that people are like, oh my God, you have to sh tell your boss how to use it so we can keep using it when you leave. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of like, you can just fix things. You can see a problem and then you just be like, doesn't have to be a problem. I can see how I can solve this. So instead of going into ChemEng after I finished my degree, I actually went down the uh, computer science route uh, to a place called NICTA, which is now part of CSIRO called Data61, um, and did all manner of things, including some machine learning. Um, so I kind of got into data science when data science was like just figuring out if it was a thing or not, which was very exciting. Um, yeah, so I did that. Then meanwhile, doing all of this, when I started my actual you know, big kid job uh, going out into the industry, I actually also started took on the leadership of GPN. So I was doing all this education thing in this other stream of my life throughout. Uh, and then I actually moved into working at an ed tech startup to do more of that education work. Um, but yeah, along the way, I figured out I could actually do more if I just left that job and just kind of used all this knowledge that I had from running Girls Programming Network and like making a national uh, organization, et cetera, by leaving the startup, which I didn't really have room to grow at. So I started my own business, Connected Code, and went on to do that kind of portfolio of careers a little bit for a little while. I was doing a startup. I was teaching at a school to like find out what it's actually like to be in a school and a teacher to try and do the curriculum and do things, uh, which is really hard because schools are like really constrained in like their schedule and how they operate. So really discovering the problem. Um, yes, yeah, so I was doing all of that. But I accidentally got a job at Microsoft. A lot of accidents happened to me in my life, apparently, um, because I thought I'd take the interview that someone's like, Renee, you have to apply for this job. It's so good for you. I was like, I'll do it. Maybe it's going to be a good business connection. Anyway, everyone was so lovely and nice. And there were so many women who were part of the leadership chain who I was interviewed by for the job. I was like, this is so cool. I could have worked at Microsoft as a cloud advocate doing the same kind of stuff that I do every day through the business, through uh, Girls Programming Network to upskill more people to have the opportunity to learn to code basically and to build real cool things on the cloud because a lot of people I think out there really struggle to believe in themselves as a developer. I know I didn't feel like a true developer because I didn't know how to make and deploy a website even though I could do all sorts of machine learning things and whatnot. So being like, okay, what if I go about and tell people how to deploy things to the cloud, et cetera. So now I get to do that while I get to do business things and I get to run GPN. Along the way, we also founded the charity around GPN called Tech Inclusion. So we could move GPN into its own little home that can get its own sponsorship and grow massively as it's currently doing. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of how I've accidentally ended up here by a variety of accidents along the way. Um, but yeah, I think it's a, my, I think I have that inverted pyramid thing as well because everything I learn, I'm just like, well, where's this going to take me next? It's my, maybe more like a meandering tree. I don't know where I'm ending up, but yeah, now now I've ended up telling people about Founders Hub as well because yeah, there's you know, I'm my startups actually in Founders Hub at the same time because I'm like, why not be in there? <laughs> and uh, if you're running a not for profit, we've got Tech Inclusion is in the not for profit program as well because like there's all these resources that you can take advantage of and then really help you like get yourself a leg up and access the advice you need at these different stages of your career or just use a lot of things on Microsoft Learn to learn how to do things because there's just all these resources out there that people don't know about. So yeah, now I just get to tell people about free resources, get to be a YouTube streamer or write blogs and just get people excited and believing in themselves that they can develop as well and they can do whatever I'm doing. By following me on my stream, or just doing it on you know their own time. So yeah, that's that's where I am now. <laughs> that's really the dream, though, isn't it? To uh, do all the things that you were doing and all the things you wanted to do, and uh, have someone pay you to do it as well. <laughs> <laughs> cool, uh, Kate. Lucky last. Yeah, that was really cool because I think there's parts of my story that I feel in both of the way that you were telling your stories. Um, 
So I was a classic uh, overachiever at school, um, did really well academically, um, and then moved from regional Western Australia up to the CBD um, in the middle of high school. And that challenge, that shift was difficult for me because I was totally a fish out of water. I didn't have a community. I didn't have I didn't resonate with a lot of the people um, when I first came into that new environment. And I think that idea of community has really stuck with me because that feeling of isolation and not knowing where you where you belong, I think, has ended up <laughs> being a big part of um, why I have this community now. Um, but it's very funny because everyone told me, because I got a really good uh, grade at the end of high school, oh, you should do law. And I'm like, but I don't want to be a lawyer. And they're like, yeah, but it's just a good degree to have. And I'm like, is it? And they're like, yeah, it's just, it looks good. I'm like, is that a good reason to make a decision that's going to cost me tens of thousands of dollars and cost me like five years of my life because it looks good? And people are like, yeah, just like, don't worry about it. Just do a law degree. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Um, so I pushed hard on that. Um, and at the time, like I was really interested in politics. Um, so I had thought that that's driven by the idea of how you make change. And for me, being part of the political system would be the quicker, like the biggest way to make change. Um, it's also possibly the slowest. Um, so kind of got disenfranchised with that idea because I wanted to make change a bit quicker. Um, but I think that's also why people are pushing me to law because I'm like, law, politics, it makes sense. I'm like, yeah, but but I'm not convinced. Um, so I took a little bit of a break and started working full time, um, just in an office doing secretarial work. Um, and I really loved it. Like the, the being, having a purpose and working um, really like I loved learning, but I loved doing more than I loved learning. Um, so being part of something and doing something and feeling like even the random secretarial work feels like you're progressing and going somewhere. Um, so I ended up doing a commerce degree. So my degree is international relations and business law, um, which is very random, uh, commerce major. And that was as, as much of a nod to law as I would get. I would do business law, but I wasn't going to do a law degree half the time and only contains the, um, the like, what I consider the important stuff of law. Um, and I was working for a charity. So I was working for uh, the Multiple Sclerosis Society running events um, and then moved from that events role to an events role at the co-working space I was working for, Space Cubed. Um, ended up staying there for nine years, um, founded Cheat Codes, was running um, operations for Space Cubed. I was running community, I was running Cheat Codes. Um, as a part of the business, we brought it under their umbrella um, of uh, running it that as my kind of part of my role. Um, and then I looked after all of the other programs that, that Space Cube ran. So we ran an accelerator program, a pre-accelerator program, a lot of supporting founders. Um, I was able to go to San Francisco twice with our founders um, and introduce them to what Silicon Valley life is like. Um, so there's a lot that I got to learn about the entrepreneurship community, about the startup and tech community in Perth um, while I was running um, she goes as most of my uh, most of my life as well, um, and then we just made the shift uh, at the end of 2023 to spin out into a new organisation. Um, so for me, uh, it's a little bit of the timing just felt like it was right. I won a bunch of awards and um, we we're getting some media attention and momentum. Um, but for me, it was also about connecting back with the vision of what we do. So um, being hyper focused on this is what we're trying to achieve and I'm just trying to achieve this thing um and being able to spend all day every day doing the things that I love and surrounded by my girls and um you know I've got my big whiteboard up uh, of what the kind of upcoming things are so it's scary being a um it's my full-time career now is running this business um and figuring out accounting and governance and risk and insurance and all kinds of real adult business things. I'm only 30, so, you know, still young for figuring out real adult business things. Um, 
but being able to connect with the purpose is uh, what's really um, keeping me going and driving this kind of next phase of the adventure. Very cool. <laughs> Very cool. Only 30. Oh, dear. Just a little baby. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I I'm feel... now, like, too old to be Young Australian of the Year after um, after <laughs> next year. You have to be 30 and under. So <laughs> when I'm 31 in September, I don't yeah. think they take the title till the end of the year, but they could. <laughs> I miss the <Yeah>. boat. <laughs> 32. You can be old Australian of the year. You don't need to be young Australian of the year. <laughs> Just enter directly into the old man's category. That's <laughs> that's the goal. We'll take him by force. <laughs> yes. The four of us together, we can take him. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, um, and ideally, yeah, ideally get get someone in tech winning it and that someone being one of you. That would be marvellous. <laughs> uh, cool. OK, well, nearly done. Um, uh, I would just like from each of you one piece of advice that you would give to women wanting to come into tech careers today. So um, who wants to go first? I can. Um, so I think that there is a lot of fear out there about tech because it's scary and unknown. And I don't know how many times I've heard, I'm not a computer person, um, but we all have phones, which are basically computers. So if you can do things on your phone, you are a computer person. Um, so my top piece of advice is let's try and remove all of those. I'm not enough or I'm too much or I'm too X. Uh, so I've been told things by my girls like I've been told I'm too fun or I'm too feminine or I'm too loud or too chatty or I'm not nerdy enough or I'm not smart enough or all of these things. Um, but like I think you can see on this panel today, like we're all such different people and we all still have a role in tech. So let's try and reframe that narrative and not count ourselves out because of the stereotype of a guy in a hoodie in a basement. Um, because I don't know very many guys in hoodies in basements in tech. There's actually very lovely, diverse people already um, in our category of men. And we're just trying to add some more women into that. But even for women, if you are at a nerd in the basement, that's cool. Um, and there's a space for you, but there's also a space for you if you're loud and fun and like wearing pink. There's a space for you too. Perfect. <laughs> Who else? Sarah, Renee? Yeah, I'll jump in with, yeah, I think, look, I'm all about what Kate just said about it being for everyone. Jenkins very about like, we try and show Kate at the start of the day, not like introduce yourself, but don't tell us what you work, where you work or whatever. Just tell us like your hobbies. Cause I think it's like so many different people out there. I think my point is going to be about joining a community because I did not feel like I belonged because of all the things that Kate just said um, and about all the culture around coding and tech that there is like, oh, you have to love Star Wars or you don't know anything about this video game, whatever, it's like if you don't feel like you belong, even if you know all the tech, you don't feel like you belong. Finding GPN was like a life changer for me, um, both from a feeling like I am, I am the right kind of person to be here, but also from the support of other people to kind of believe in my own abilities. And so I think so like being in a community that is supportive and gives you opportunities to do things that you might not be willing to do if you were getting paid to do them because you don't think you're good enough. So like my very first time I volunteered at GP and they're like, oh my God, thank you so much for signing up. Like we need so many people to do all the things. Like we are just short of people. Can you be the person who's in charge of like checking in all the kids and doing all this? I'm like, okay, um, sure, I can do that. And also, can you get, do, a, do a lecture on dictionaries? I'm like, okay never done a lecture before I'm like you'll be great don't worry about it and then even though the projector broke in the middle of my lecture um and I had to go and do it on the whiteboard I still managed to do it and I did it without slides and every all the other women in the room were like yep you got this and like when the projector came back on middle of the thing they're like okay yeah no you were up to this on the whiteboard I'm like that's this slide let's let's make this happen but just realizing that I could do that 
and having those opportunities that I never would sign up to do a paid lecture when I was 22 years old or something. I didn't think I would be qualified, but now I have done so many other things. Like I learned graphic design because someone needed to do it. I, you know, can run an event because someone needed to do it. I, I accidentally inherited GPN because someone needed to do it. And then when you just have an opportunity because someone needs to do it and you realize I did a good job of that and I could do something a little bit harder next time, then you realize you can do anything and then you can go from I've never given a lecture to I've never started a charity, but I figure I, I, I always figure out things so I can probably do it. Um, so I think wherever you are on your journey, like doing something with a supportive community that you wouldn't otherwise do uh, is an amazing way to boost your own confidence and just try a fun, cool thing so you too can have an inverted pyramid life. Perfect. <laughs> Sarah? Um, I would just add that there may be some senior women on the call. Um, so those who have, you know, um, got to to leadership positions. And I think that it's important that we, you know, when we're talking about inclusion, that we recognise the the strength of the women who have, have, you know, who are still around, who are still standing, who are absolutely, um, you know, really championing and, and making it to those roles. Um, but my piece of advice goes to everybody from them and beyond, and that is that uh, I think that the key to your career success is having a, a group of women to be able to turn to and be able to have that support from them. So I say get yourself a girl gang, um, you know, someone where you can call and be like, hey, is this right? Is this, you know, is, is this a unique experience or is this something that everyone goes through? Um, and being able to have that support means that you will feel less lonely and that that is your key to being able to succeed is knowing that you are supported, you are loved and um, someone will always be your champion. Awesome. That's perfect. Um, I have a couple of things that I thought of while you were all talking, so I'm going to end on those two things. Um the thing that I love most about working in tech is that everything changes every single day. Like you wake up in the morning and they've released like a million new things and everything is different. And people might think that that's scary. But in fact, what I think that really means is no one can ever know everything. And so if you feel like you're out of your depth and you don't know all the things you need to to no well no one does no one can and if they do act like they know everything they are definitely faking it and so no need to be scared we are all in this crazy mess together and it is a fun opportunity to learn together especially if you do have a supportive gang of women at your back um, and the other thing is do the thing that scares you when I was younger, I was really scared all the time and I didn't want to speak up in meetings and I didn't want to volunteer for stuff that I didn't think I would be able to do well. I didn't want to embarrass myself. I didn't want to look stupid. Um, now I am old and uh, care less about what people think. I noticed that my, you know, that the young women in my network don't don't seem to have that fear and they ask a million questions and instead of it making them look stupid it makes them look smart it makes them look interested it makes them look curious and I want to be like those young women um the other thing that I noticed is when you do agree to do the things that you can do very easily you end up with all the boring jobs like taking the minutes and getting the coffee and then there's some other guy on the stage having a glorious opportunity and talking about something he doesn't know anything about just because he was brave enough to say yes to the opportunity so if someone asks me something and I'm immediately scared I will say yes to that automatically and if someone says something and I could do it in my sleep then I say no to that and that is my decision making process now uh, the reverse of what is uh, automatically in my heart. Cool. Well, thank you all for joining me today. I think we have a marvellous episode to put out. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for taking the time and uh, we will see you all soon. Welcome to Western Australia. My name is Kate Cohen and I'm the founder and CEO of She Codes Australia. 
We're really excited to be part of the Code Without Barriers program with Microsoft. My name is Jira Naike Naksuo. You can call me Jia. I am a solution architect for data and AI at Microsoft. I'm excited to inspire inclusion within my community for Code Without Barriers in Australia and in New Zealand by teaching and passing on the knowledge of data analytics and machine learning. I'm Tracy Rothery, and I am a really proud part of the Whitworth community, Women in Tech WA, and a super proud She Codes alumni. I am extremely excited to be part of Code Without Barriers. And for me, inclusion is all about being my whole self. I love to bring joy and enthusiasm to everything I do, for anybody that knows me. And I think kindness is the key to uplifting others and making them feel really supported. So I'm just excited to be a part of the Code Without Barriers community. And that's it. My name is Vanessa and I am a cloud solution architect at Microsoft. I'm excited to inspire inclusion in my community for Code Without Barriers in Australia and New Zealand by being a visible role model for young women and girls through mentoring and sharing my story with them. Hi, my name is Anto and I am a Azure specialist at Microsoft. I'm excited to inspire inclusion in my community for Code Without Barriers in Australia and New Zealand by being myself at every meetup and sharing my personality so everybody knows that that's okay. Rock and roll. What a tremendous panel. That was so inspiring. Thank you all for joining us on our inaugural Australia and New Zealand Code Without Barriers webinar today. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. And don't forget, please register with us and we'll share those links to you at the end. Thank you. We would love to have you amongst us. Code Without Barriers is that warm, friendly, supportive environment to help you accelerate your career in tech. And we are looking forward to having you all amongst us. It's a great way to build inclusion uh, for our women and make sure that we are uh, investing in accelerating progress uh, across digital skilling and connected communities. It creates a more inclusive and respectful work environment for everyone, uh, regardless of their gender identity. I think that code without barriers is not only beneficial for women, but also for men and the whole society as well. Code without barriers will benefit all of us, uh, not only in terms of coding, but it is a platform that can uplift all every woman in 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 the world to achieve more it's not just about how many numbers uh, the women we have empowered it's more so more about how we feel every woman being valued being heard and being celebrated to help empower women and the community and build together an environment where women can help and also encourage them to build more develop more and innovate more on this era of ai and cloud so for me, Code Without Barriers has really helped me to, uh, you know, uh, work with the major clients in uh, this region, primarily on the diversity and inclusion background, and also to help the female uh, talent, uh, technical talent, uh, for supporting the organization. It's a strong opportunity for us to come together as a community of committed partners and build technology teams, whether it is developer teams, data or AI teams, teams that truly reflect the diversity of the society that we wish to serve. My journey in CWB from being a very passive audience to appreciating, to understanding, to start seeing the value of the network and people around. And now moving on to advocacy has been a very personal journey. We are excited to continue the journey to inspire more women to code and delve into the possibilities of AI, data and cloud. For me, it means giving back, it means empowering women, it means giving women an opportunity that they did not have before. Uh, and it simply means bringing a lot more women together on that journey uh, where they, they are able to grow 
and uh, and and that's exactly what all of us are setting out to do so love being part of with our barriers a lot of times the women representation in tech is very minimum so i hope with the code without barriers we really have no barriers for women in tech code without barriers is ensuring that we bring the women along in the era of ai in the era of digital transformation and contribute to gdp as much as to their own personal growth today i want to celebrate the sisterhood celebrate the women who are uplifting other women through the program i also want to celebrate a strong allies who not only support but also lead some of these initiatives to bring the women along thank you Thank you.